caring for yourself, if you have any accessibility needs, you can let us know or you can let our volunteer at the back, I forget your name, I'm sorry, Nick or Alexandra, you can let us know. Bathrooms are downstairs. If there's anything you need from us, um, just get the word to us and please feel free to come and go as you need. So, our goal was to apply the principles of solidarity economics to shift our thinking and transform the theater sector, just a tiny little goal that our learning circles have. This started because, um, how many of you know Sima? Sima Sueko is an extraordinary theater artist who couldn't be with us today, she's in Hawaii. And she won the TCG Alan Schneider Director Award in, the, in 2022 at the TCG conference. So at the, I think it was the last in-person conference. With that, part of what she did with what she received, she received some funds from getting that award, was to launch the Solidarity Economy Learning Circles. So since that time, we have been engaging and discussing and learning from one another, and we created a drop box that we continue to drop things into. This presentation will end up in the app, so if you are interested in accessing that drop box or this slideshow, you will be able to do so in the app later. Uh, we would do things like define solidarity economics, talk about cooperatives, time banks, alternate cur currency exchanges, communities of self-interest, envisioning the arts world that we want, commons like HowlRound, um, purpose-driven leadership and other leadership models, post-carbon arts sector, land facts, reparations. You can see we've talked about a lot of different things, and we also did a deep dive into needs and offers exchanges, which is an ongoing experimentation of which you are now have joined the experimentation. There were, I think, three or four groups that would meet at different times and we've sort of um, coalesced over time and come together. So, what the definition that we are using is that solidarity economics is a global movement to build a just and sustainable economy where we prioritize people and the planet over endless profit and growth. It grows out of social movements in Latin America and the global south and it provides real alternatives to capitalism, where communities govern themselves through participatory democracy, cooperative and public ownership, and a culture of solidarity and respect for the earth. And I think what's important here, too, is that the solidarity economy, it is an evolving definition as we think about the expansiveness of the resources we individually have and how those could be exchanged with one another in a practice of reciprocity. Uh, so as we have this definition, it is ever growing. You know, a solidarity economy ecosystem is an environment where all of the things a community needs are controlled and governed up by everyday people, which means as we evolve, obviously, those needs and resources do change. So, uh, you know, that's one of the fascinating things of sort of the ahas that we had as learners in that group and not experts coming in because it's constantly growing. So the conceptual shift that we're exploring is, can we apply the concepts, values, and tools of solidarity economy to transform theater making? We are not the first people to ask this question, and there are many grassroots theater companies and other theater companies who have been doing this for decades, right? It's more that our kind of mainstream theater institutions are not adopting these values and principles. But there are many examples that we've learned about across our nation and around the world that have been doing this forever, successfully. So we're looking to them to see how can we influence our more mainstream institutions to shift resources, ownership, narrative, relationship, and culture. And so much of that, too, really is also changing the mindset of that we're coming from a deficit to where are the surpluses that we do have, right? That we have, you know, we have access, you know, access to different resources. Yeah. So for us, when we looked at our theater field at large, and remember we're like a composite of different theater artists from different places around the country, from different sectors, uh, or different areas of our, of our sector. But our experience is that the focus is too often on the institutions and it's not meeting the needs of the individual artists and art workers. Are there folks here who might agree with that? 
Yes. <laughs> um, we feel that institutions, obviously there are exceptions to this rule, um, but they tend to favor the organization over the individual. We've been seeing that over the pandemic. Um, they tend to prioritize their own interests over the overall theater ecosystem. They compete with each other over scarce resources and while restricting access to resources. And they don't appreciate the power of mutuality, the identification and prioritization of mutual self-interest. I think those of us who have, have worked in those theaters, we understand why all of this is happening, and yet it is clearly not in the benefit of individual artists, art workers, and our field at large. <clears throat> so these are some of the examples of, uh, and I'll be curious to hear from all of you if you have other examples that you would like to share of organizations that have inspired you. Um, but these are examples of places that we have looked into and discovered that use solidarity economics in different ways. So there are artist worker collaboratives, cultural hubs, land share agreements, learning circles, mutual aid and, and food pantries, different things like that. Uh, do any of you know some of the ones on here or have your own? Yeah, which are the ones that you know? Free, free theater. Yeah! Are you represented here?
ways that you are having mutual aid and bridging the gap between mutual aid and theater. Um, and there are incredible lessons from what you're doing that we, we feel, and I imagine you would agree, can be just taken and plucked and put into our more mainstream million dollar, multi-million dollar institutions, right? And everyone is talking about how do we, how do we get communities into the theater, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we just look to theaters like yours, um, you have all the answers about <laughs> how to do that, right? Yeah. Um, was there, did you also have a? Oh yeah, uh, I'm here with Obvious Agency. I won't say a lot. We're doing a session on Saturday. We're a worker in cooperative. Uh, the session is all going to be about democratic management, uh, and it's specifically about how you can apply it to various types of organizations. Um, but yeah, we'll also talk about that. So. so that's Saturday at what time? Uh, 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Uh -huh. A great part two, a great on its own about how to take this further and bring it in. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to lift up one because you mentioned about like the worst business model ever. <laughs> Everything's for free, uh, and ironically. Free Theater, uh, which is located in Germantown, Maryland, that's actually where it's rooted, although it's sort of nomadic, it's a youth-led, youth-driven theater organization that works on that same model, everything for free. So these are teens who work alongside an adult board who helps to guide them with grant writing so they can bring in professionals for one particular, you know, like, period of time to receive training, and then they launch everything themselves. And they call up different theaters to barter and borrow different props, costumes. They have bartered uh, the use of mics, wireless mics that used to cost them about $10,000 to rent, but they managed to move that away from that with just simple, we can go ahead and provide some advertisement. But these are kids who are now taking this model and learning how to write grants, and learning how to practice mutual aid. So I just, I wanted to lift that up because I think there's hope. <laughs> like the next generation is taking it. Yeah. Um, so here are a few other examples of time banking, alternative exchanges, um, credit unions. That was one of the really easy things. We did an audit within our learning circle of just our personal lives and like what are things we could do in our personal lives to move more towards solidarity economics and switching our bank to a credit union was like this really relatively easy way um, to do that. Worker co-ops, community gardens, farms, and fridges. And you'll see some examples of other ways that we have kind of put this in. So what we noticed when we did do our own audits is that we actually do this in more ways than we might already know. We just don't label it as solidarity economics. Um, and so that was an affirming moment for us all. So it exists in all sectors of the economy. There's this massive foundation to build on in different areas. So you can see all the different ways that it's used in production and reproduction and distribution and exchange and consumption in finance and in governance. Um, and so it sounds like your session will be focused on some of this stuff, mm -hmm. how to be able to take this and put it into practice. Um, so that's very cool. And if I wasn't presenting at that same time, I'd so love to be there. Is it going to be recorded? Uh, I think so, yeah. OK. <laughs> I'm going to go. OK, excellent, excellent. You can share with the group. Yes. Um, so exactly. So when we looked at this, and we were like, oh, I do a clothing swap with my friends, or I do a, you know, uh, a skill sharing, or I do this or that. And we were like, oh, those are things that would fall under the broad solidarity economics framework. So we have a video that we would like to share with you from another Chicago-based organization, Cola Nut, which you may have um, experience with. Um, but time-based currency is an alternative currency or exchange system where the unit of account is the person hour or some other time unit. So one hour equals one service credit. Like a volunteer works for an hour, they're credited with an hour. We actually looked at a few different models where it could go in threes. So like, you know, Elena might need something from me, but I don't need something from Elena, but I need something from Alexandra. And so we would work together to like share that hour. We also looked at an example, I think it was in Switzerland. It was Switzerland and Long Beach. Where people will work um, 
will gain time credits when they're younger by helping senior citizens, and they gain credits towards their senior needs when they are older. So you can gain enough credits to completely pay for your own like senior care by the time that you are in need of that, um, or you can gain some credits towards that. So what you have is a lot of young people and seniors working together using the time-making system, and it's also not depleting Social Security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're gonna sh show you that video, which was a last-minute addition because Mike shared this with us just right before we came, so thanks to the tech crew for figuring that out. My name is Mike. I am the founding coordinator of the Colonet Collaborative. This is a service that allows people to use their time as a type of currency in order to get their needs met. What I understood of economic justice and solidarity economy as a practice is that people are trying to implement things like worker cooperatives or food cooperatives as aspects of economic justice. And those are the probably some of the hardest things to lift off the ground. But a time bank and being able to connect with other people around their offers and needs is a very simple, tiny thing that you can do just with the neighbor next door. Time banking is trading time as a currency. And what that means is that someone who has an hour of time to share with another person in the form of a skill, such as teaching someone how to ride a bike, they go into the time bank, they find someone who is requesting that service or they offer up that service themselves they're able to earn an hour in their time bank account. The person who received the service would have a deduction from their time bank account. Only thing required inside of the time bank is an hour of your time as the currency. So that's what time banking is for you, and this offers a needs market. It's just a way that we get people into the experience of time banking like it was money, like it was a currency. So I hope facilitate the, the offers and needs market, so shifting people to actually thinking about what is the practice of time banking in your community and in your organization where people are actually in the experience of, if I was in a time bank, what would I offer to someone in this room? And what do I need from the people in this room? So what is the Offers and Needs Market? The Offers and Needs Market is a 90-minute to two-hour session that allows us to think about what are the skills that we have to share with each other, like cooking jerk shrimp, like household budgeting, what are the things that we have to share with other people? And what are the things that we need from other people? Usually when we're doing the Solidarity Economy 101, the primary question we ask people is, what values would you prioritize in a world that you think is fair, just, and equitable? And usually when we have that exercise, there's a matchup. A lot of people want to have a fair and equitable world. A lot of people you know, want to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And a lot of people want to help other people. is just the importance of bringing these different elements together. So the, the time banking is a really important part of getting people to understand what they, what they have to offer and what they need and how that connects to other people in their space. And the cooperative is a next evolution beyond sort of that general camaraderie, reciprocity, and connection with neighbors. And so for me, the time banking is really important. It's the seed of, of being able to build the type of communities that we want, build the type of lives that we want, to be able to be the people that we want. But the time banking is the vehicle for all of the collective aspirations and needs that we have.
learning circle was able to, to do that, to like connect him and help him kind of find community. And um, it was massive, you know, and he was, oh, it was read his play. Like, what are there people who would be willing to read his play? Uh, and so he got that and it really lifted his spirits at this time when he was feeling lost, um, just moving to New York. So this is really, I think you wanted to share a story and Seema also had a story where she, um, just in her rehearsal, you know, if you're a director on your first day and you've got actors from out of town, it's like, what have you got? What do you need? And instead of going out and you're gonna have to buy salt and pepper and olive oil and all the basics, it's like, what can you have as an exchange? And she just created a little exchange in the corner of the rehearsal room and it really helped like the out of town actors. So it was like a really relatively simple way to have a community pantry inside the rehearsal hall. Right, and the thing about the community pantry is that it's not something necessarily that is saying that there's a person in dire need. It's just that, you know, it's simple exchange. It's, it's you know, what's available. And I've seen that get, you know, put in place in many theaters already. You know, it's just, it's there in the green room, right? Um, but then we also can see it, uh, we practice this as well, as well at my university, I teach at Bowie State, which is a small HBCU in Maryland between DC and Baltimore. Uh, and we have a community, we have a community pantry as well, and students can go by there at any point to go ahead and pick up anything that they need, including toiletries, which, you know, is some of the things that we just, we don't think about, but that are consumables. Um, so there's really not a limit about where to set it. And, and what it looked like so that there's some autonomy. So the one that particularly stood out to me was one that set up outside of my children's old elementary school. So I'm sure we're all probably pretty familiar with the little free libraries that exist, which of course is another act of solidarity coming. Uh, but they have taken those little free libraries and they've turned it into a non-perishable pantry for people. And particularly when we get into the summertime or those breaks, that's when they, it's so hard to access those resources. And it just occurred to me, I was like, right, we have so many of these little free libraries around, and it's just a, a simple thing you can do. You can actually literally just set up outside in the block, right? Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with little free library, there's a whole map system. How many people have seen the map of the little free library? Right, like it's all over the country. You can, so it's, it's those kinds of things that make a really great impact in just wherever you are, whether you're identifying literally as your leader or just saying like, I know I can move the needle because we all have a needs, period, beyond ourselves as artists. So we're slowly gonna be moving into our offers and needs exchange. So this, so for those of you that need to go, um, if you're here and you get to put in a need or an offer, that's great, you will be able to access, if you take the, like a screenshot of the QR codes, you'll be able to access the final database after, so you'll still have access to stuff. So this service is opportunities to exchange with one another outside the currency of the dollar. Time, knowledge, shared resources. So here are some examples from our learning circle. We've had script readings, copy editing, grants research, advice on boards and governance, EDI conversations, Canva tips, marathon tips, um, you know, sharing recipes, like, so it doesn't, it can be just with your personal life. People need a dog walker or a babysitter or, right? Or it can be professional, like I need help with my resume or what directing books should I get or, you know, what do I do? I've just moved here or there, can you introduce me to people? So think about what you need or what you'd like to request. Um, you can use this just as an example, but you also might end up really actually fulfilling some, some needs. Uh, what's on your calendar? So do you, if you think about what's upcoming in your life, are there needs associated with that, that the you know, geniuses and the knowledge mind of this group might be able to help fulfill? Could you use some physical help? Like, do you need new headshots that you can't afford, you know? Or do you need to build your Instagram page or something like that? And you're like, ah, I don't know how to do TikTok. You know, maybe there's somebody here who can help with that. Where could you use somebody else's expertise to help you move more towards your goals or meet your needs? Um, so we start with needs, and sometimes people can be like, I don't like to write about my needs, you know? Um, and we get that, but we had that at the beginning, but it really did become so fruitful, and there's those things we have in our lives that we just 
don't know how to solve, or we don't have the time to figure it out, or we don't have the money to pay for it. And this is such a community building way, collaborative way to do it. It's so nourishing and fulfilling. So here's what it'll look like. You will, you can see an example on the tables of what the forms look like. We're gonna be asking you to do that on your phones or your laptops. If you don't have something like that with you today, um, we will come around and, and put that in for you. But you'll put in, now, we will be sharing this with everybody, so make sure you put information on there that you are comfortable with other people having. Because the whole idea, as part of this experiment of our ongoing mutual learning, is that we want to know, like, did you follow up with anybody? Did you actually connect to share anything? Um, how did that go for you? You know, what was the result of that? So think about your own boundaries around what you want to share, but your name and your email address will be shared. Okay, the other thing to know is that you want to be really aware, something we've learned doing it is, you want to be aware of each other's um, lives. You know, like if you're, if you're somebody who's like, I need 10 hours of EDI training. It's like that might not be a reasonable request of somebody's time, especially because we don't have a set up like reciprocity about you're going to get something, you're going to give something. We don't know that for sure. You may just be asked to give an hour of your time, but there might not be something where you're going to be able to receive an hour of somebody else's time. So be clear about your own boundaries around I can give you half an hour of my time about my expertise about what to do when you visit Latin America, right? But I can't give you, I can't talk to you four times over the course of the next month. So we always recommend when you do connect with the person that you're like, okay, what are your boundaries? What are, let's make sure that we have a mutual understanding about what we're giving each other here so that no one ends up feeling um, taken advantage of around, around their time. And one thing I think that's been really helpful too as I've been framing this is that when you do make that offer, thinking about like, right, there's the things that I can offer and I've got that knowledge or those skill sets because of these other people who are extended. And now we start to involve more people in the needs and offers. So maybe you can only give that half an hour of advice on like, you know, international travel, but you're like, but then you can extend it out to another person. And that's totally, that, that's another resource, right? Are there any questions about that, or does anybody need any examples, or do you feel like you are good to go with doing the first need? All right, all right, go for it. I'll roll it around. Grab the QR code. If there's anybody who does not have a digital device and would like you to look to provide assistance with entry, feel free to find it. Oh, yeah. Feel free to do multiple ones. We'll, we'll see how much time this needs. Yeah, my plan currently is to go to the check out. Is that the one, y'all? Yeah, I
going to be live or something, there was some way that we were going to still be able to incorporate the virtual folks. Mm. So they might be able to just click on the QR code on the slide, and they might be able to find the find the form. Another minute or so. No, 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 I'm smiling.
those are the conversations we try to have with the institutions. Like, they gotta shift the concept to get there. I agree with, yeah, yes. I have a thought about that, if that's okay. Yeah. Like, I think I'm more interested less in like institutional currency coins than funder currency coins. You know, because the reality is like a lot of our large theatrical theaters, that was a bad sentence, <laughs> have gotten there at the expense of small community-based um, bipoc run theaters. You know, they have diverted resources, funders, they have convinced funders, you know, like, and so I'm not that interested, actually. I know this sounds so, like, such a hater move, you know, to be like, oh, if I clock enough points, then one of these large multi-million dollar institutions mm -hmm. is gonna give me something. I'm like, you, you, in fact, are the reason why 30 of us are struggling, and yes. who is accountable to that, you yes. know, and like, yes. why should that be reciprocal, you know, and that sounds so horrible, like, yeah. if it's Denise or it's Elsa, or, you know, like, I'm very happy to be reciprocal, like, yes, I got you, you know, like, we only have each other, anything made by people can be changed by people, that's our motto, you know, but then when it's like a large institution, I'm like, not you though, I am, <laughs> like, if you shut your doors forever, I don't care. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so horrible. I know, but it's sort of like we got here in this way that was so problematic, and reciprocity isn't going to get us out of that at the institutional yeah. level. Yeah. It's very sort of personal level. Yeah. I don't know. I know that does not personally. Yeah. Just sort of digging no. in of like half that. That's a reality, right? right? Yeah. Like, and and the only way that we can deal with the conversation is to state that state that fact, right? Like you have to state the, the beast in the room, and that is that's absolutely true. Yeah. You know, and is it is it you know seeing some of the trees falling down in the forest as we have an opportunity for us to make this kind of movement even larger in response? I mean, one thing that strikes me when we're talking about institutions is like the serving the building, mm -hmm. serving the build the church. Right, <laughs> that that seems to gatekeep, and and that's something that in this practice here goes well beyond a building, right? Yes, there are resources within certain buildings, like the washer and dryer, yeah. right? But I I would say it doesn't solve it. However, the persistence, yeah, that's what's you know what's yeah. drawn me to this particular. Yeah, and it's. We have this conversation in learning circles all the time about like, and I think we're having it in our field all the time, right? It's like, are you building a new table? Are you trying to make the table bigger? Are you trying to get a different table? You know, like, how are we doing this? And, and at, a, at a fundamental level, it's like, the system upon which our field is built is diseased, right? It was never, it's not a good foundation that we're on. So it's very challenging to know you know, people are going to come from all different places in that. And there's a reason why the organizations that have been doing this for decades have smaller financial budgets. Like when you look at their 990s, right? They're actually rich, much richer than other organizations in many ways. And if you if you made all of the stuff they get and you put a currency to it, they would be multi-million dollar organizations. But there is a reason, to your point, of why all the big ones have gotten so big. Hmm. So this is certainly not going to change that system because that system is so deeply entrenched. And that system has its consequences on our mental health and our physical health and, how, and our spiritual health and our financial health. And this we have found to be healing, right? Because you're making those connections, you're realizing, like just looking at our list, you're like, oh, I have that expertise. Oh, I can share that expertise. And, and our expertise is not usually really valued in our sector nearly enough. And so this, this has felt healing to us while understanding it's not fixing the diseased foundation of our field. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here. I, I love what you're talking about here. I, my curiosity is about scaling up the institution to institution. And I love that provocation of like, what does it look like for funders to take this and run with it? Yeah. And that is very exciting. Yeah. You know, give that to Darren Walker. <laughs> 
like, all right, Ford Foundation, you're leading the way, here we go. Um, other thoughts, other ways that this is resonating with you personally or professionally? So one thing that just kind of makes me uncomfortable about the time change is that not everybody has free time or like the you know privilege of being able to give extra time to things. And so it kind of feels like it's just switching like hours from dollars in a way that like doesn't actually address who has the capacity to give and then you know yeah. receive. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Time is the ultimate currency, but for right. some folks, they don't have time. Yeah. It's like parents are like, I'm not going to bake the cookies, I'm just buying the cookies. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time is a, yeah. Then it's, you know, I, I think yes, <laughs> agreed. The one thing I would say that I find intriguing about the time concept, though, is how we compensate certain skills over other skills with our current currency system, right? Uh, that the preschool teacher is compensated less than the corporate CEO, which I think a lot of us would say seems somewhat inherently wrong, <laughs> right? But if now we take that and say, I'm just putting two hours next to each other. And the value that you feel as an individual, as you know, we, Kristen talked before about how you can bank some of those hours in Switzerland, so that when you're older, you can cash those in. But also, that somebody who is older has skill sets that may not be valued in our capitalist system the same way. But have, recognizing everybody has value, and everybody has worth, and that is a place of time. I think, you know, it's another way to look at it. Right, we don't all have free time. I totally agree with you. I guess I think it's better. Materials, you know, what are other currencies? So if you don't have money or time, do you have something else? Is there another way to um, be looking at? We're so fixated on money as our currency. So just broadening our our perspectives to say like, what are the other currencies? Um, and time is the is another big one. But what are the other ones? Um, yeah, what are the other ones? Like, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, I love what you said about the sharing of resources from funders. And why couldn't a big organization in any city say, when you give me money, a certain amount of it is going to go to these other theater organizations, or that you have access to space, right? Which is the currency I think, that is probably at the top. Space. Yeah. Um, the other thing, I was, I've been part of the, the Solidarity Economic Circle um, in the West Coast, and so, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, shared resources with um, uh, scenery and costumes and, and how can we have like one space that sort of houses, you know, in a world where flats are so much more expensive than they were three years ago. Right. Why are we throwing so much away? Yes. So why couldn't we just house yes. it somewhere and we all pitch in to collectively secure that, that uh, space that we're renting, but that we have access to it to go and use whatever is remaining. And we're wasting so much just wood, yeah. <laughs> nails, you know, yeah. things that, that we are not uh, aware of in the same way. I mean, the sense of like, you know, these are, these are resources that we have taken for granted. Yeah. Why aren't we in a space where we are saying, oh, no, we're not going to get rid of that. We'll just house it and maybe somebody else can use it. Um, I think that's really interesting to me. Yeah. I know that there's lots of costume sharing exchanges with bigger regional theater companies across the country, but what about a local effort to sort of just say, as opposed to, I know someone I can call, why isn't it just, here's a space where yeah. we have a queue. Mm -hmm. You know, let's face it, most of the things that are built for any show are never going to be used again. Um, not, you know, anything of a period anyway. And so how can we sort of turn that resource into something that is fundamentally supporting all of us? Yeah. And there's something that you said for, that for us to go back to that initial definition of solidarity economy that is people and planet first. And that notion, right, that you know, we are 
we're, we're not actually really environmentally <laughs> sound as an industry in many ways, right? We can be far more efficient and far more, far more effective if we're actually putting the plant the person that you bring it that way. And that's something that I think also, you know, talking about like how do you widen the circle of who is invested in this, folks who are really looking at like what are the fundamental changes that we're making responsibly as theater, theater makers to make our, our, you know, art more sustainable and lasting. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of offer that attitude. Yeah. That, like there's, there's that other benefit that's beyond time, right? Like we're looking to, like what, how can we leave a small world? Yeah. So money, time, space, equipment, expertise, mm -hmm. um, many ways to kind of open it. When folks are looking at, we're gonna move into um, the needs, and it looks like people are already also putting in offers, so that's awesome. So can you identify already, if you haven't already put any offers in and you want to, please go ahead and do so. Can you identify any of these things that you're like, oh, I wanna like, I have that, I can meet that need? Like who can meet any of these needs? I know I can meet the cash flow financing strategies need and the press release need. I know you're gonna meet the stronger quads exercise tips need. Who's Ariana? Some folks may have left, so we may have you may have to reach out to them by the email that they shared. Is anybody able to make any theater connections in Denver? can definitely do tips and tricks to self-care. <laughs> and like, for example, I don't know how to help Zoe navigate the theater arts scene in the Bay Area, but I have a couple friends here, so I can connect Zoe to, you know, Sheila, who's here, who lives in the Bay Area, who can have a conversation with you, you know, over breakfast at TCG. Like Beth and I are gonna have a chat about millennials and Gen Zers versus baby boomers and Gen Xers and how we're trying to have everybody work cohesively together at organizations. Would you like to join that conversation? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right? That's a very real thing. Um, so lots of really exciting offers here. And you can see that some of them is like, there's no time, it's like any time. Might be a drink over TCG, it might be next year at TCG. Like some of these are not urgent, some of them are. Many of them are virtual. If we look at the offers, there's people with expertise in copy editing support. Oh my gosh, I am totally taking that when we up on the Google Drive file organizing. See, so we can swap. I can help her with her cash flow strategies. She can help me with my Google Drive organizing. And we've met two things for each other. Budgeting support expertise. Grant writing, reviewing. I bet, how, how many of you look at the um, offers? I mean, it's very impressive, right? To see the amount of expertise in the room that's been offered. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just, we hold so much knowledge to be able to help each other. We can help Zoe write a press release. So then it's about like, okay, I don't have four hours to your point to give, right? Else I don't have four hours of my time to just give at the moment. But maybe I can send an example or send a link or connect later or say like, hey, reach out to me in six months if that's still useful to you and I can help you at that time if you haven't already gotten help. Because it can become exciting to like see if all, like I can help with all of this. And even a referral, I don't have the time right now, but actually one of my colleagues knows how to do this and they have a little bit of time. Just that connection. <coughs> so even if you're not gonna follow through, but just raise your hand if you are looking at the needs and you think you might be able to meet one of them. You're not committing to anything, but just, just for us to be able to see. Yeah, right? That's amazing, that's lovely. Very cool. Okay, so because some folks have left, right, and some folks are still here, it does seem that the connecting part is going to have to happen virtually. I think so. Right? Um, because we were going to take some time and be like, find your person, but like, because people have left, um, I think that that's going to happen virtually. So 
that is that we'll get that will be more robust because it will include Gail's virtual list for her session as well. Exactly. So Gail's list, so when you get these lists, they're actually going to be Google, a Google form, or it's like it's going to be a Google sheet, and it will be in the app, and then you will go into it and see if you want to participate, if you want to experiment with it and see how it feels to like pick one and follow through with it and see how it goes. Obviously our learning circle would be like super curious about how that goes. Um, so we could jump that. Yeah. Some of them have to know that our content that has people to And I think that's going to be here too. Yeah. I mean it's here on the side. Yeah. So we want to just as we come to a close over the next sort of 10 minutes. Um, we want to help you just if you want to conduct your own pop-up exchange, right? You can do it in your personal room, your theater, with your friends, classmates, any kind of online network that you have. You can connect it as an iterative tool. You can experiment with how you want it. We've taken a couple that we learned from Cola Nut and from some other um, workshops that we looked at and attend, very ones of us attended, and Gail is the one who chose Airtable. But you can just do it with a Google form. You know, you can do it with Post-it notes. You can figure out how you want to do it, what makes sense for the group that you're in. And hopefully, this is what we discussed all together, right? Of like the exchange, the advantages of doing it. We talked about. We could already see the connections happening with people. You know, it's like it's definitely a way to get to know one another as well in a time when loneliness is an epidemic. It strengthens our own agency, not having to rely on other people to do it. Um, contributes to the sustainability of our organizations by ch sharing your class and sharing your costumes. Improves our own mental wellness we talked about. Increases what we think of as available to us, as available resources. And builds, hopefully, stronger theater communities, right? right. Anything else that's not on here that you experienced as an advantage of doing the exchange?
to, because you have to, to meet the system's yeah. needs, like in order to uh, just deal with the bureaucracy? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, and part of it is because we were not founded as a corporate software as a nonprofit. So, like, we were founded as like a traditional hierarchical theater company like 20 years ago. This um, and we, uh, you know, operated with an artistic director, and the board did that, and whatever. And then, uh, camera. Um, <laughs> and then, um, the, uh, in the last couple of years, and then this year, we've sort of done the official like, legal transition. Um, we've been moving away from the hierarchical model and operating horizontally. So now we like everyone is paid here, and everyone is paid exactly the same. Everybody gets paid. Like, we actually have like a pool of hours kind of to operate from within our budget. Mm -hmm. uh, decision, we have like a collective decision making process. Um, and the board is sort of in, and the way that we operate is instead of being like so and so is the head of communications or whatever, it's like we have like a communications hub. And a group of people are in that, and board members can also be in those. So our board members are like in our fundraising hubs um, and in our budget hubs. Um, and we have like one board member who sometimes comes to the communications hub because she, outside of her work on the board, like does political communication. So sometimes she'll come and be like, I have a newsletter idea or something. Um, does that make sense to kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's connected to what was shared before about how it's not a solution because at yeah. different turns we run into this entrenched system, whether it's the institution, the funders, or the government. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, like, if you don't have a home as a theater, yeah. and your P.O. box cannot be your official government address, right. and so it's such a pain, like, so we do come up again, and we can't, we are working to advocate in TCG and us as individuals, we're doing our, our, our what we can to advocate, to change that system and advocate for policy change, but that, that's a, you know, that's a, not going to be fixed in our own time. Yeah. I just wanted to add that you don't have to have a separate board of staff. Your staff is just can be your board members if you give them a staff. Yeah. It's like it doesn't have to be the divide that we think there has to be. What is your so, recommendation? Yeah. Alternative theater ensemble? Alternative theater ensemble, which we yeah. add. Oh, we'll also add that um, there are board members who've left, like in our transition process. Like there are people where they're like, I'm not, I don't really get it, I'm not like down. And then the, which at first I think everyone was sort of like, oh no. Uh, and then it's kind of worked out where like the folks that are still there are like our really cool dope board members who are down with the cause and are down with the philosophy. Yeah. Um, so I feel like it's been a positive experience with like a lot of growing pain, but like, and, and it's things we're still figuring out, but it's definitely been, um, I don't know, you, you end up with a lot of people who are like, we want to do this thing together. I think what's really uh, striking me about this is back to like, a quote that Mike Bobbin had said several years ago, which was, you know, Robert's rules are Robert's rules. Mm -hmm. They're not requirements. Like, those are all made up. There's only two things you got to do. You got to have a board that like, meets at least once a year, and then they pass a budget. Yeah. That's it. Who does it? Right. Right. Yeah. system that we have functioned in for so long is the barrier. That's why none of the grassroots organizations that have been doing this for decades have been able to grow substantially because they keep coming up against the system. So if we wait for the government, it will be too late. If we act as individuals, it will be too little. But if we act as communities, it might be just enough. Well, that's what we advocate in the learning circle. Um, we are, we've been having conversation. Is there anyone here who thinks, oh, I'm going to try to do this in my next rehearsal room or in my, with my friendship circle or, yeah, what are some of your ideas? I'm trying to figure it out because I, uh, I work also, so I'm a director, but I also direct and work at um, an academic institution that is state run, right? So I'm thinking about, okay, I want to set up a food pantry, but my doors often locked. So how do I put it in the hallway? But I can't put anything in the hallway. So can I affix it to the door? Oh, um, yes. Can it lock? Like I'm trying to figure out, because there are all these rules, right? There are so many rules that I know I'm not going to get anywhere. Yeah. So, I'm, so I think maybe if I can affix it to my door and it hangs. Yeah. It was just beautiful. It's like one of those shoe right? racks. Yeah. 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 Shoe racks. Where people keep taking our toilet paper. <laughs> I, we, no one in my building. 
child will see her. And now it's created a whole thing. But I think creating a community pantry just in a corner of our green room where I can just stock it with toilet paper, that then people can take that, which is fine, instead of taking the toilet paper that we need to run our theater for other people. I think that is like it. That has been a revelation for me. <laughs> it's been a revelation for me because I don't want, I'm not going to say don't pay toilet paper because I, I, like when I was making significantly less money and working for like a corporate institution, I was making toilet paper left, right, and center. Like, <laughs> I needed what I needed. But it's been like an issue because I don't want to say don't do that. It's because I understand why people are doing it and I don't care. It's just a massive inconvenience for me. <laughs> So excited. the challenges, the things that are frustrating, and for 
we're also us just all learning together as a group, and, and you know, we become smaller relationships. I think is so much of what helps to mitigate these things. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to close us out and shut sure. the TCG? Closing remarks. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>